Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, I'll be discussing my thoughts on episode 11 of the anime series, Brynhildr in the Darkness. And we're pretty much picking up right where we left off with this super-powered hybrid S-Class Witch Valkyria pretty much tearing up the free world as we know it. As we see left in her wake per the last episode, she has left all those A-Class witches, uh, you know, who were supposed to be overseeing her and keeping her powers in check, keeping her under control, as just a bunch of corpses strewn across this park at the end of the last episode. And as we begin this episode, you know, following on from that, she's made her way up this mountainside where she ends up accosted by a bunch of these riot gear wearing cops asking her questions about the bodies they found in the park. And this is where we see the limitations of her abilities, of which through the course of this episode, we find out there are eight. You know, they're pretty much all of the miscellaneous singular powers we've seen all the witches in the series up until now wield on their own. This girl has them all in one. And the limit of which is summoning antimatter into a matter-based universe, thus creating a nuclear explosion the likes of which no one has ever even encountered. I mean, they're reporting it on the news like the mountain uh, was a volcano that erupted, you know, essentially. And she's completely unscathed because one of her eight powers is actually the ability to regenerate. Now, why this is interesting to me is because, of course, in amongst the, you know, Class A witches that were supposedly slaughtered by her, there is actually a survivor. This girl, Hatsuna, were debuted to in this episode, who also has regeneration ability. And by, you know, basically letting herself heal and using words she overheard spoken by Valkyria, she ends up leading her way to the observatory where Ryota and his witchy wards, as I refer to them, are staked out. So, it's absolutely hilarious when she happens upon the scene, and because of Kazumi's plan, a sort of strategy, if Valkyria was the one to show up, they're all decked out with this blood-like, you know, face paint and, and makeup and everything, figuring that if Valkyria comes a calling, she'll assume they're all dead and don't have any more death suppressant pills, and she can just leave everything alone and go away, which is somewhat uh, fallible, if you will. But it's very intriguing to note that Hatsuna immediately recognizes Kazumi, Kana, and Kuroha. They recognize her, and yet she doesn't recognize amongst the group which is the one character, if you've been following my reviews of this series, you know that I've been holding a solid question mark above the head of because her debut coincided with a scene, you know, with uh, Ichijiku of the lab talking to his shadowy conglomerate overseers about sending someone out to get on the inside of their group. And even though it also coincided with a double A class, which at the time coming around and wreaking all kinds of havoc, I've still always been questioning what Katori's real motives are and what her origins are and everything like that. And so it's very telling, I think, that Hatsuna doesn't recognize her. And she even goes to the extent of being surprised by the powers she wields when later, you know, we find out basically Hatsuna's trying to test the selflessness and just how willing to give up his life Ryota is. She climbs up at the top of this, like, tower, and she says she's scared, she's going to fall, gets him, you know, essentially tricks him to come up and try to save her. Then she goes to make, like, she's falling off the side, he grabs her hand, he's literally risking life and limb to make sure she survives, not believing her when she says her power is regeneration, that she won't die, um, short of cutting her head off or the lab activating her honest beacon, which would let her melt down, you know, like all these witches do. So he risks life and limb, falls, and at the last second, Katori's teleportation ability saves his life, completely mystifying Hatsuna. So that is interesting. It, it just strengthens the question mark I'm hanging over Katori's head. And following on from this, we have more comical sort of interactions because Hatsuna now feels like she's fallen in love with Ryota and it just keeps that, you know, sort of unrequited love rectangle going on where Ryota's interested in Karoha, Kazumi's interested in Ryota and, you know, now this other girl comes in and we see that Karoha's getting jealous so there's that, you know, essentially... And we find that Ryota talking to his scientist friend that they can actually produce these death suppressant pills in a much shorter amount of time because of some elements, you know, in papers that were written by Ichijiku of the lab. Apparently this scientist knew Ichijiku very well in their youth uh, as students or something, you know, some such like that. And his paperwork is what 
pretty much led to where his position is now, um, essentially overseeing whatever this conglomerate, the shady conglomerate as I call it, creating these witches and doing tests on human beings and manipulating them. You know, he is the penultimate hinging factor in all of that. And to know that he actually has ties going back to the scientist is interesting and that his paperwork has allowed for the scientist to come up with a plan to create these pills in a shorter amount of time. But the problem is that essentially means only one of these girls, you know, is going to be able to survive with the amount of pills they have remaining to each of them. But Ryota doesn't want to let that stand. He wants to try to put something into motion. And then Hatsuna, of course, this new girl, we find out she actually has a stock of these pills in her possession. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they end up dividing these remaining pills up. And then, of course, we see that essentially a Jijiku of the lab is being reprimanded by this shadowy conglomerate that's overseeing him. They are severely disappointed with whatever high hopes and high estimations they had of his abilities in whatever it is their plans are that they talk about uh, having in motion and all this stuff, so much so that he has to take it upon himself to seek out Valkyria and meets her in person, and it's very interesting how she is the pinnacle in this sequence of Stockholm Syndrome. You know, when first encountering him, she's talking about how badass she is, the limitations of her powers, how she's going to wipe out anyone who stands in her way, and he slaps her and all of a sudden she's a crying little baby running to his arms saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And so it's a very interesting dynamic. That, But of course, it also builds up to his controlling her and leading her to this observatory where all these witches are hiding out with Ryota. And that is where essentially the pinnacle cliffhanger of this episode leaves off with the helicopter of the lab closing in and Valkyria just suddenly teleporting in, just ready to kill and slaughter all these witches or do whatever her mission statement is and have hinted at as a potential revelation when Ryota encounters Valkyria and he gets a good look at her he says something about how similar she looks to Karoha and I'm wondering you know okay what is this a relative of hers is this her sister her mother something like that so obviously there's some closer connection and maybe that'll play into the overall story and then the sort of penultimate aspect that I've talked about many times if you've been following my reviews of Ryota finding out that Karoha is the girl he lost in childhood Neko, his best friend, finally, in this episode, in a moment that was, you know, you wouldn't have seen coming for anything. You know, essentially, Katori has gotten together some cups of orange juice for everybody. She trips just out of the blue. It lands on Karoha's shirt and stains it, and she's like, take off your shirt, let me wash it. And this is finally when Ryota sees the three moles that indicate Karoha is Neko and all this kind of stuff. It was done in such a backhanded, offhanded kind of way where they made it like, you know, it doesn't even really matter at this point. It just, you know, as we're seeing the recollections of Ryota, calling back on those flashbacks we've been seeing since the very first episode of he as a young boy and his childhood friend and the, you know, gravitas of those scenes. In that moment, I should have been ecstatic. I should have been super excited that finally we have the recognition I have been waiting all through this series to see. And instead, I was heavily reminded of of how different this series has played out than my thoughts and my hopes from its inception. It was definitely something completely different than I expected it to be and thought and hoped it would be. That is not to say that, you know, it's an overall disappointing series. I've enjoyed a lot of it. I found a lot of it compelling and interesting. But those flashbacks, you know, going back to Kuroneko being this long-lost childhood friend of Ryota's and him finally finding out that Kuroha is that girl, it just, it didn't feel like it had as much weight as it should have, and it hasn't been touched upon nearly as often as I wish it would have been through the course of this series. Um, you know, all of that said, I still greatly enjoyed this episode and the pinnacle cliffhanger we leave off with. I will be chomping at the bit to see where we go in the next episode. What's going to happen? You know, are they going to be able to successfully beat Valkyria, or will they all be wiped out in the process? Will the lab come out the victor? You know, who knows which way this is going to go. And, uh, yeah, otherwise, that'll be pretty much it for me on this. I hope this video finds you well, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.